Joining us now uh, in an exclusive interview to talk about the markets, the Fed, and so much more right here in Davos, Switzerland, Peter Orzag. He took over as CEO of Lazar just three and a half months ago, back in October. Previously served as director of the Office of Management and Budget under President Obama. It's great to see you. Good to see you guys. And to help uh, us kick things off on, on day one. We always think of Davos as sort of, um, sometimes we think of it as a contraindicator. Sometimes we think of it as a signal. What are, you, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? We're trying to, I think, all sort of get a test here of where things are going. I think a fair amount of constructive optimism on the U.S. economy, a lot of concern about Germany and the U.K. from an economic perspective, and then massive concern about politics. The politics, I mean, I saw you last night. The politics of what's happening in the U.S. and how that affects the rest of the world, or you think the politics of what's happening vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the different crises and wars in, in Ukraine, in Israel and such? All of the above, but disproportionately, you know, what will happen in the U.S. Okay, so let's go to that. What do you think is, is going to happen in the U.S.? We've been talking about Iowa uh, just in the last half hour. Clear, clearly, it seems like former President uh, uh, Trump is going to become the nominee. How do you think, what do you think happens then? Well, first, I think it was very likely that Trump was going to be the Republican nominee before Iowa. It's more likely now, but it was always very likely. Um, I, look, I think it's going to come down. It's going to be a close election. Every election in the U.S. is going to be close because of how polarized the country is. And it comes down to fundamentally age versus abortion uh, with African-American turnout and then uh, all the uh, cases surrounding Trump as, uh, you know, auxiliary players with the, the tip may being the economy. And the economy is seen as much worse than it is, but that can change over the next uh, well, Can I ask you about quarters. that, about the perception of the economy? Yeah. And, and I've heard you talk publicly about how, how good I think you think the economy is. People get a lot of blame when things are bad, right? So when you see gas prices go up, people say, it's that guy's fault. I don't know whether people get credit if you see gas prices go down. Well, I think what's happening here is three things. One, there's a lag, so it takes a while before perceptions of the economy catch up to the actual economy. So that needs to kind of play through. The second is there's clearly a deep partisan split on this issue. Republicans think the economy is much worse than Democrats do. And as the country polarizes, that gets worse. And then the third thing is there's new evidence out, and I don't mean to, you know, harp on the media, but that given GDP, given inflation, given the stock market, the new sentiment is much more negative than it should but be. Let, let, disproportionately let's, let's give relative people to some credit for how they feel about, about yeah. their own personal finance. So I would say that gas prices, when they come down, but are still up 40, 50, 60 percent from where they were when Biden took office and said he was going to put fossil fuels out of business, that's a problem. That, that trickled through to, to inflation across the board, whatever you want, supply chain problems. I'll, I'll grant you that it wasn't all Biden's fault. But when it slows to 3 percent from 8 or 9 percent, the 8 or 9 percent for two years is still in there. So people are spending, since Biden came in, 35 percent more for groceries. And they feel that. Real wages didn't start growing until the beginning of 2023. For two years, you were underwater. You're still below where you were when he took office in terms of actual wages. People have enough to, to be able to say, yeah, I'm not feeling great, and it's not the media telling. And believe me, the media would like to give Biden the, uh, the benefit of the doubt, and, and you can't. People feel this, and I, I, get, I get tired of people saying, you know, it's, it's too bad that you don't understand the economy. You're not bad off, and, and you know. No, no, I don't think it's that. I mean, I agree. There's a lot of pain. Look, step back. I mean, you want to talk about frustration in the United States? Two-thirds or so of the American population has seen flat or declining life expectancy over the past 15 years. You want to talk about you know, a core issue, you don't, it's completely understandable. That's, that's pandemic related. I no, think, no, it's it? not. No, no. This is, this is deaths of desperation. Lower, it? It's yeah. low. And even, no, I said two thirds. I mean, it's, yes. it's up to the middle class it's, too. It's, this is deaths of, of desperation. Yeah. This is people frustrated with uh -huh. their, with yeah. their, with yeah. their, you coming know, across an with open their board, outlook in coming life. across an open So border. it's completely there. Now, we can debate I, uh, the most recent macro indicators, and I'm not uh, denying that many people are still in uh, lots of pain, but the most recent macro indicators are bet. First of all, they're really good relative to what you would have thought at the beginning of the pandemic. We've come through this much better than, you know, one would have thought. And secondly, uh, there is a there is a disconnect between at least the macro indicators and how people are talking about the economy. Peter, let me ask you about how businesses are feeling, sure. I and mean, that's how consumers yep. are feeling. You talk to CEOs all the time. You're looking at the potential for the Fed to start cutting rates. Uh, in a, in a, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that. Okay, you don't, you don't agree with that. You're not a believer. Now, look, I, 
first, I think people misdiagnosed inflation. It was mostly pandemic uh, coming and going. That having been said, I do not think the market expectation that the Fed is going to start cutting rates anytime soon, at least until like very late in, in this year, is likely to play out. Just look at what Jay Powell is saying. A. B, they're going to be concerned about cutting too aggressively during an election. They will claim that they're not, but they will. C, uh, they really do not want to have to go back to quantitative easing. So holding the rate higher for longer means that you then uh, have the opportunity to cut and rates. And then finally, the balance sheets and finally, so. why cut rates? What's the impetus for cutting rates when, A, you want to make sure that you've really stamped out inflation? And secondly, the economy is not in recession. But so what does that mean for the economic outlook? And what does that mean so for I think businesses that's... potentially getting back into M&A? And yeah, yeah. Starting so to move again? first of all, for M&A, high rates are... A, a, a negative, but stable rates are a positive. So high and stable is not so bad. And I think what's what's happening, the reason the M&A market has started to turn is exactly that, that people have seen the kind of uh, pivot from the Fed. And that's created, along with, you know, some losses in court for the government on antitrust, a renewed uh, uh, effort at M&A. And then with regard to the economy, fundamentally, the labor market remains, in the U.S. at least, not in Germany and the U.K., the labor market remains uh, pretty good. And the consumer, although there are some signs of fragility, including uh, in default rates, the consumer has held up pretty well. Can I go back, though, to this, I don't know if it's a conspiratorial view, but, it, but people talk about it. You know, would the Fed lower rates in an election year? How does that work? You said they would do it later in the year. Don't well, you think I, that? Get, like, but don't you think that yeah. the closer you get, yeah, the closer, the closer it's you get to, to the election, is, actually, it's even harder. Yes. And so, to the degree that there's something going on in people's heads about how do we do this in the context of an election, you almost have to. If you think you have to go late, you almost have to go early, or or literally or into 25, which I think is the more likely scenario. Like I think. Look, he's been very clear. He's going to hold it, hold these rates, you know, higher for longer. There's no immediate impetus to cut. He keeps saying that. Can't you do and a PC? Can't you do a Taylor rule that, that tells you that we're too tight right now? If you believe that core is at a certain level, I mean, you, you can you, you can do it if you did purely mathematically and didn't think oh, yeah. about. Or the University I mean, of Chicago yeah. says that you're looser than ever. Yeah, I, right. look, I think I, I'll be blunt here. I think the inflation problem has, ba despite the fact that prices are higher, as you correctly right. noted, the inflation problem is basically solved. If you right. take out housing out of the index, then we're too tight. Right. You're at you're well. You're at right at about target. Doesn't mean you're necessarily too tight, but you know you're no about target.